morning. Good morning, sir. I can truly say that it is incredibly good to see all of you today. And I'm very happy to be back. And I can't wait to see all of you uh, now that we're back uh, as often as we can. So that's a good thing. You know, one time here at St. Gabriel's, I was serving at the 8 o'clock worship. I was vested in an alb and I was ready to walk into the day. And as we do, we had gathered together as a group prior to the service to pray. And by this time in my life here, I, had, I was not a complete stranger to leading worship uh, in different capacities, but I had never been to this service, to the 8 o'clock gathering. So I was saying a few extra prayers to myself under my breath, mostly centered on not forgetting and with thy spirit. And all was good as we walked to this side door. When the time had come, I opened the door and began to hold it for the others to pass through. And Father Bill whispered into my ear words that struck a momentary fear into my heart. You first. Now I'm not one to shy away from a challenge, so sure, I understood that I had to go first in the line in front of the ordained ministers. It made sense, and I walked through the door and took my place at my seat, only to turn and watch the others walk right past me down to the center aisle where they reverenced the altar before joining me on the side. I had led the party with no particular idea of where to lead them, and I was quite embarrassed, but you can bet that from now on, and from that point on, that I ask for directions when I'm leading someone else for the first time. <laughs> and at least now I find myself able to lead from the back of the line, so that's a plus. <laughs> but I was thinking about this story when I read the Gospel for this week. It's very much like when Jesus sees the crowds approaching through the wilderness. And instead of issuing orders or marshalling resources or doing any sort of action, Jesus says to his disciples, you first. And the place where we encounter Jesus this morning is very familiar. Even if you have only heard a few of the stories of Jesus' life and work, you have already likely encountered one of the stories of feeding large crowds of people from just a few loaves of bread and some fish. And it's the symbol that we know so well at St. Gabriel's, isn't it? It's in the center of our Five Feed Fill logo, those bread, loaves, and fish. And it's a story that we lean on when resources are tight. And we hope that we can stretch ourselves and our offerings across a multitude of needs. But this story is more than that. There are some liturgical scholars that point to this text, this particular version of the story that we have in John's Gospel, as the genesis of our Eucharist, or at least one important model for it. Like the story that we will retell shortly in the Eucharistic prayer, this feeding also takes place on Passover. And in fact, in John's Gospel, there is no Last Supper where Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, passing bread and wine. But rather, after the final meal, there is a foot washing where Jesus shows that the model we are to follow is one of service and humility. So some believe that the community of that Gospel writer had this story, this feeding in mind, as their context when they gathered to share meals together. When you and I gather around this table and pray the Eucharistic prayer together, there is so much more that happens than a community taking bread and blessing it and sharing it. But you knew that already, didn't you? These actions are the center of an entire life. And that is where the loaves and the fishes come in. Did you notice the part where there are leftovers? Not just some, but 12 baskets that have been left behind. This might have been a detail in the story that was used to explain God's goodness and God's abundance, but it is important to us 
because it stands to remind us that there is something else happening here besides hungry people being fed. The feast of God is always for more than those who are gathered. Twelve baskets of bread from a few loaves and ten thousand fingers. Jesus saw the crowd approaching, but he also saw the others who would come. Who isn't here with us today? Who eats the leftovers of our shared experience of Jesus? When we come together in the context of God's overflowing love, we understand that there is more bread, more body of Christ than our hands can hold. And there are more who are hungry for what Jesus offered. Jesus saw that crowd approaching, but also saw their true need, their true hunger. And we are Christ if we have that vision. When we see the hungry and feed their need, not just any who are hungry, but those who are nearest to us, those who are heading towards us, who seem to be crowding us out sometimes. The act of feeding that comes from Jesus is never just for a biological need, but a giving act of self that would keep growing with the need of the world, a world that is hungry for God. We know that the world seems violent. You may have heard that statistic that on the day of the most recent mass shooting in the theater in Lafayette, Louisiana, there had already been 204 mass shootings in the United States just this year. And that occurred on the 204th day of the year. 204 mass shootings in 204 days. And this is not to mention those people in other places of the world where this does not seem so unusual. So yes, we seem to be surrounded by the opposite of God. But this also reminds us that people are hungry for God, desperate for more. And what is our response? What is the church's answer for the opposite of God in the world? Sometimes our response is more of a complaint than a response. A cry of lament to God for the violence that we or others encounter. And often our response is to come here, to gather together to share the soul-comforting words and actions of the God of love. But the truth is, that is only half of an action. If we carry the name of Christ in our worship and bear the mark of Christ in our lives, coming to a place like this is never an end result. Coming together as a community reminds us of who and whose we are, but it always leads to movement into the world. The movement of our liturgy and our sacramental life is a circle. We come in, we tell stories of God and us. We pray, share meals, maybe sing, and then we go out and we tell stories of God and us, sometimes in words. And we pray, share meals, and maybe sing, and then we come back in and it all repeats again. The Eucharist always points us back outside. Our identity is rooted in sacraments like baptism. But being baptized into Jesus' life and death and resurrection doesn't just mark us as members of the club, but brings us into a dance whose rhythms infect our daily lives. All of life is a Eucharist a feast of thanksgiving to God. If we live our days centered on this table, the church should indeed have a response to the world's need, whether that need be acted out
our head into the sand of our parish buildings, but if we live our lives anchored by our time in this community of faith, we know that God is calling us into relationship, not just with each other, but into a full life in the world. We move from the table where the body of Christ comes together, and then we go out into the world where those who are hungry for God are gathered. God's first impulse is always toward nourishment and wholeness. And we have bread. We are bread. And Jesus says, you first. Amen. Amen.